This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. The new Indian interior minister acknowledged that security and intelligence lapses may have made the Mumbai attacks easier to carry out and vowed not to let this happen again. This comes as India declared the highest state of alert in its most important airports. Meanwhile, the Russian president, Dmitry Medvedev, who is visiting India, vowed to support the Indian government in the so-called war on terror. Security and intelligence lapses did not help to spare Mumbai of the 60 hours of terror last week. This was the acknowledgement of this man, the new interior minister, Palanapian Chindambaram. He confirmed accusations made by the media as well as the Hindu opposition party, Bharatiya Janata. Chindambaram, who took over the interior ministry office a few days ago from his controversial predecessor, Shivraj Patel, even acknowledged that there was a great deal of evidence that there is some kind of relationship between the groups that carried out the Mumbai attacks and other organizations that were involved in previous attacks in India. India accused the banned Pakistani organization Lakshtar Tiba of planning the attacks. This comes as Indian media suggested that the Pakistani intelligence agency has former relations with the banned organization. Pakistan completely rejects all these accusations and expressed a willingness to help in the investigations. So far, Pakistan is still facing accusations and perhaps isolation. International pledges to help India in the so-called war on terror continues, the latest of which came from the Russian president Dmitry Medvedev, who is visiting India with the hopes of establishing friendly relations between the two countries. The two sides signed agreements covering several defense areas and space projects. Probably one of the most important agreements is the one that calls on Russia to establish four nuclear reactors in southern India. This agreement, which comes only 10 days after the Mumbai Mumbai explosions sends a message to India's nuclear neighbor that the consequences of the Mumbai attacks are not limited to the Indian territories. According to Palestinian sources, two citizens were martyred and a number of others were injured during an Israeli air raid on the city of Rafah. The same sources revealed that one of the martyrs was 15 years old, Ramzi Dehani. The new attack by the Israeli occupation took place near the Gaza International Airport. Meanwhile, citizens held a funeral procession for 28-year-old Mohammed Kamel Abu Dra, a member of the Al-Aqsa Brigades. People expressed their anger at the continued crimes of the occupation. Abu Dra was martyred when Israeli forces killed him in cold blood as he was on his way to visit his family. Settler saboteurs escalated their terrorist attacks against different villages in Nablus. Dozens of settlers attacked the homes of residents in the villages of Yasma, Kabalan, and Al Sawiyah. They vandalized residents' properties and slashed the tires of dozens of cars. Dozens of settlers also attacked the villages of Simgle and Raska Kereh and destroyed people's properties.
إلى ذلك كثف المستوطنون من هجماتهم العدوانية باتجاه المواطنين. Settlers also escalated their acts of aggression in the Al-Ras area and the Al-Jabari neighborhood in Hebron. According to local sources in the city, dozens of extremist settlers attacked a number of homes late at night using dogs to injure citizens and their children. More than 30 citizens were injured in one of the latest attacks by settlers in Al Jabari, Wadi Al Hussein, and Wadi Al Nasara neighborhoods. 11 of the injured arrived to Hebron Hospital, the rest went to Muhammad Ali and the Red Crescent. The settlers also set a number of cars on fire and destroyed homes and grave sites. وتعطيم الزجاج ونوافذ المنازل وشواهد القبور يصير ان هذا ليليا هذا القطعان attacks by settlers happen every day they come out of the building which they took over by force and go to different neighborhoods every day they go to al jabri area wadi al hussein harat jabir and other areas around them as a result our children can't sleep our neighbors can't sleep and we can't sleep this is not a normal life Settlers who are protected by Israeli occupation forces renewed their terrorist attacks. Ambulances could not reach the injured individuals in many locations. The emergency unit of the Al Aliyah Hospital received 11 injured people who were bitten by settlers' dogs. It seems that international observers are unable to do anything because they are restricted by agreements with Israel. They cannot even talk in a clear way about what is taking place. Regrettably, settlers' activities have increased recently. Citizens are very terrified by the settlers' attacks on people's homes. We are trying to do what we can, but of course we can't stop the settlers. The settlers have tried every method to terrify citizens, including the use of police dogs in order to achieve their criminal plan of forcing the Arab citizens to leave the city of Hebron. These settlers are supported by right-wing extremist rabbis and Knesset members who visit the Hebron settlements every day. According to the Israeli Haaretz newspaper, the possibility of launching a ground offensive in the Gaza Strip by the occupation forces is not likely to happen in the near future. The report cited that an offensive at this time will not defeat the Palestinian resistance or stop the raging fire of its rockets. In addition, the occupation forces fear that Hezbollah may open a second battlefront in the event that Gaza comes under Israeli attack. Haaretz further said that the Zionist entity is betting on Palestinian internal division. It added that as long as the security forces that are loyal to the Palestinian president Mahmoud Abbas are not strong enough to take over Hamas's positions in Gaza, then there's no need for a military operation at this time. Meanwhile, Israel's Minister of War, Ehud Barak, confirmed that the occupation will be forced to pay a high price for the release of kidnapped Zionist soldier Galad Shalit, who is being held in Gaza by Hamas. In its weekly report, the Palestinian Center for Human Rights said that the occupation forces during the past week have arrested more than 30 Palestinians and have carried out more than 17 incursions in various cities in the occupied West Bank. The Israeli occupation has carried out sweeps throughout the various provinces of the occupied West Bank. This news comes despite the promises made to the head of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, during his repeated meetings with the leaders of the Zionist entity. In its weekly report, the Palestinian Center for Human Rights said that the occupation forces during the past week have carried out more than 17 military incursions in the various provinces of the occupied West Bank, kidnapping 23 Palestinians.
Thus, the number of Palestinian civilians arrested in the West Bank since the beginning of 2008 has amounted to 2,216. The report also accuses Zionist settlers of continuing their systematic attacks against Palestinian civilians and property under the nose and protection of the Israeli occupation forces. Meanwhile, the security forces loyal to the head of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, continued to carry out major sweeps against Hamas leaders and supporters in the occupied West Bank. The goal of this campaign is to stop the Mujahideen from carrying out attacks on the occupation forces and the herds of settlers. An imminent threat is looming in the occupied West Bank, where the residents are being pursued by the Zionists at night and by Abbas-run security institutions at daybreak. The scandal of the Palestinian pilgrims who have been impacted by the conflicts between Fatah and Hamas remains a black spot as both movements take advantage of the pilgrims whose hearts are longing to perform the fifth pillar of Islam. The bigger farce is that each side accuses the other of hindering the travel of the pilgrims to the Holy Lands, and there are only four days left until the ritual of standing on the Mount of Arafat. Saudi Arabia will wait for the pilgrims until the last minute so that they can perform the rituals of the Hajj. This year, the pilgrims of the Gaza Strip have been prevented from performing the Hajj rituals due to the political wrangling between Fatah and Hamas. The minister of the Aukaf of the ousted government said that his government did all it could to make this a successful Hajj season. He said he wanted it to be away from political differences. He accused the ministry of Aukaf in Ramallah for being behind the failure of Hajj after it registered its own list of Hajj pilgrims from the Gaza Strip, despite the fact that the ousted ministry had already submitted its own Hajj pilgrim list. The Palestinian Authority accused Hamas of preventing the Hajj pilgrims from the Gaza Strip, who the Palestinian Authority had registered from leaving for the Hajj. Meanwhile, each side blames the other. Our brothers in Ramallah are solely responsible for this crisis of the Gaza pilgrims. It is their custom to insert their political conflicts into everything. This time they injected political squabbling into a purely religious affair, and that is the Hajj. Amidst all these difficult obstacles facing them, the pilgrims are asking about the reasons that have prevented them from performing one of the pillars of Islam. They officially requested that the ousted Gaza government and Fayyad's government take sole responsibility nationally and ethically for allowing them to miss the Hajj this year. Absolutely, no one has the right to prevent anyone else from carrying out these rituals and mandated worship, prayers and worship in God's house, especially considering that Hajj and Umrah are one of the five pillars of Islam. The political differences between the Fatah and Hamas movements, as well as the siege on Gaza, are considered the two main reasons for the lack of measures being taken to permit the Gaza pilgrims to travel to Holy Mecca. The Hajj crisis brings to the forefront suffering experienced by the Hajj pilgrims last year. They were under siege, but in the end they were able to make the Hajj. It appears that a Hajj crisis repeats itself every year amidst clear foot dragging by both governments in Ramallah and Gaza. A person hopes that in his lifetime he will answer God's almighty call to the Hajj. He works day and night so that he may be able to perform this mandated act of worship. However, to prevent people from the Hajj will create a lot of depression, which is added on to the depression that already exists among Palestinians who live in the Gaza Strip. It seems that the crisis of the Hajj pilgrims repeats every year amidst clear procrastination by both the Ramallah and Gaza governments. Meanwhile, the Hajj pilgrims from the West Bank have left to perform the Hajj. For Al Madar, Walid Abdurrahman, Abu Dhabi TV, Gaza. Just like Washington, London is trying to have its own security agreement with the Iraqi government. This issue, however, has generated a great deal of controversy among the British public, who have been demanding that their country disengage from Iraq as soon as possible. 
Diar Alomari reports from London. The Iraqi and British governments are working on several agreements pertaining to the military, security, the economy and education. A spokesman for the British government, John Wilcox, said on an official website that the negotiations process is going well and that negotiations over details are still ongoing. Wilcox added on the same official website that the Iraqi government has demanded that the British government keep a battalion of soldiers and military personnel so that they can train the 14 Iraqi divisions of the Iraqi army and develop the Iraqi navy in the Gulf. We attempted to call the British Foreign Ministry Office to obtain more details. At first they welcomed the idea, but later they apologized, saying that there were differences pertaining to the agreement. However, the information that was leaked confirms that it will officially deal with security and the military, in addition to oil contracts and education and economic protocols. We also spoke with the official spokesman at the Iraqi Embassy in London, Sayed Ali Al-Bayati. He declined to comment live on camera so that his words would not be distorted. However, what is the fate of this pact and what will it establish? This agreement will not be welcomed by the Iraqi public. The British understand that. For this reason, we find them to be very cautious about announcing any part of this agreement. As for the British, their opinions are mixed. This government moves in very mysterious, this government moves in very mysterious ways. Those who voted it in are feeling guilty. The devil is in the details. This is how the Iraqi-British pact is being made, in a dark room away from the lights before its contents are revealed. Will this pact stir controversy between Baghdad and London, if not officially, at least publicly? A question that waits to be answered. Diaromeri, Dubai TV, London. A security source in the Diyala province announced the arrests of three terrorists during a security operation west of Sadia district. The source added that the Iraqi security forces carried out a wide-scale military operation in the areas of Imam Iwasi and Zahal Himrin, uncovering a cache of weapons, mortar shells and explosive devices. During a press conference in Baghdad, the head of multinational forces in Iraq, Lieutenant General Lloyd Austin, said that terror attacks in Iraq fell to a record low this month. General Austin said that the Iraqi security forces have made exceptional achievements and gained valuable experience, which will enable them to maintain security and stability nationwide. The security improvements achieved in Iraq are really wonderful. Attacks fell across Iraq to their lowest monthly level since 2003. This represents an 80 percent drop in attacks nationwide since March 2008. Attacks fell in November to their lowest monthly level since the Iraq war began in 2003. The number of caches uncovered in Iraq during 2008 is 24 percent higher than last year's number. This has stopped the flow of such lethal weapons into the hands of those wishing to do the nation harm. In a joint operation with the Iraqi security forces, we directed a major blow to the enemy of Iraq. The joint Iraqi and multi national forces have killed and arrested hundreds of individuals who play a major role in the operation of al-Qaeda terrorists such as Abu Ghazwan and Abu Qasra. The multinational force announced that the Azerbaijani forces have ended their military services in Iraq and handed security responsibilities over to the Iraqi army. In a statement, the multinational force said that the Azerbaijani forces have ended their mission in Iraq in a celebration that was held at Al-Assad Air Base in the Enbar province. The South Korean forces officially handed security responsibilities over to the Kurdistan regional government. The South Korean forces are expected to complete the withdrawal of their troops from Iraq by December 20, 2008.
Before heading back to its country, the South Korean-led Zaytun brigades handed security duties over to the Kurdistan regional government. The transfer of authority took place in a farewell ceremony held in the Kurdistan regional capital of Erbil. The South Korean forces, which operate under the slogan, We Are Friends of Yours, left a positive impression on the people of Kurdistan. Since its arrival, the Zaytun brigades have launched several construction and development projects in the Kurdistan region. In return, the KRG expressed thanks and gratitude to the South Korean army and said that its withdrawal is only the beginning of a good relationship between Seoul and Erbil. The return of the Zaytun brigades to its country does not mean by and large the end of both nations' relationship. On the contrary, it is the beginning of a new page in our relationship and cooperation at all levels, including political and economic. This relationship will help serve both sides' mutual interests. The South Korean forces, which assumed security duties in the Kurdistan region four years ago, didn't suffer any fatalities or come under terror attacks. Unlike other Iraqi provinces, the Kurdistan region remained outside of the cycle of violence and terror. This prompted the Zaytun brigades to focus its attention on helping the region in its construction and development efforts. The Zaytun brigades and the people of Kurdistan have worked side by side toward making this country better through the efforts of reconstruction and the development of infrastructure. This has been our objective since arriving here. The face the Zaytun brigades have shown in the Kurdistan region is the one that the Iraqi people have hoped to see from other multinational forces. It's the face of construction and modernization without using the language of weapons. In front of the Palace of Conferences in Erbil, Abdallah Sabri, Iraqiya. Palestinians brace themselves for more attacks by extremist Israeli settlers. Will the Israeli government be able to contain the violence? And can Palestinians win in Israeli courts? Answers to these questions and more on Link TV's Mosaic Intelligence Report. Palestinians in the West Bank are bracing themselves for more violence by extremist Israeli settlers after their eviction from a Palestinian-owned house in the town of Hebron. The settlers say that they had legally purchased the house, a claim vehemently denied by its Palestinian owner. One settler came into our house. He took a gun and shot me and shot my dad. And then thousands came down in front of the army. There were clashes between the army, police and settlers. They started burning the houses. It lasted for four hours. Since their eviction, settlers have torched fields, olive groves and yards in Hebron and nearby villages. They also opened fire on Palestinians, wounding three. Violence has also spread to areas around Nablus and Ramallah. In Bittin, north of Ramallah, settlers broke into a home and vandalized Palestinian property, and in several other West Bank villages, anti-Muslim graffiti was sprayed on mosque walls. Shortly after the Six-Day War in 1967, Israeli settlers forcefully took over several homes in Hebron, on many occasions under the watchful eyes of Israeli soldiers. In 1994, Baruch Goldstein, a doctor who had immigrated from the U.S., machine-gunned 29 Palestinians to death as they prayed in Hebron's Ibrahimi Mosque during the holy month of Ramadan. In 2005, I worked on a documentary and witnessed firsthand the plight of a Palestinian family living in fear under the continuous harassment of the zealot settlers who were determined to drive them away from their ancestral home. Ironically, the settlers had named the house they occupied in Hebron Beit HaShalom or the Peace House. Under an equally ironic title, Tolerance, the city of Jerusalem has given the Wizard Falls Center the green light to destroy an ancient Muslim cemetery in the Mamella neighborhood of West Jerusalem in order to build a new museum of tolerance there. Construction work has already begun in a corner of the graveyard. Dozens of bones have been dug up and no decision has been made over what to do with them. We demand that the cemetery's holy and religious sites be protected. The occupation, however, does the opposite. They do not show any consideration for our feelings and dignity. They constantly attack both the living and the dead. Palestinians opposed to the new building say that any proposal to build on top of a Jewish cemetery would never have been allowed. 
When a grave is destroyed at a Jewish cemetery in Russia or France, the entire state of Israel is in shock. In Jerusalem, an entire Muslim cemetery is being desecrated and no one cares, a Palestinian reporter told me over the phone. Finally, Umm Kamal al-Kurd walked with dozens of activists from East Jerusalem to her original home in the Talbiya neighborhood in West Jerusalem. She's attempting to exercise her right of return after Israeli forces evicted her from East Jerusalem Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood. The Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood in East Jerusalem was built by the UN and Jordanian government in 1956 to house Palestinian refugees from the 1948 war. However, with the start of the Israeli occupation of East Jerusalem following the 1967 war, settlers began claiming ownership of the land the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood was built on. Last month, the Israeli authorities forcefully evicted Umm Kamal along with her ailing husband from their house in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood of Jerusalem, where they had been living since 1956. Umm Kamal had for two weeks been living in a tent not far away from their home from which they were evicted, along with international peace supporters. Last week, Israeli police and military personnel brought in a bulldozer and demolished the tent. The ailing husband has since died in a Jerusalem hospital. I feel sorry for them because they are such weak people. They have to exert their power over a tent and a woman by herself. If Israeli settlers can make property claims in East Jerusalem based on title deeds that pre-exist 1948, why can't Palestinians make similar claims in West Jerusalem? I'm Jamal Dejani for the Mosaic Intelligence Report. To learn more about this program or to share your thoughts, visit us at linktv.org slash mir. You can also read my blog on the Huffington Post. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs programs which connect you to the world.